In this webinar, we want to learn more about how the living income concept can be used in value chain promotion. How do we see its potential and how can it improve our value chain promotion strategies? So the living income concept has been developed in the last few years, more or less at the same time as the second edition of our Value Links approach. Value Links 2.0 already refers to first publications of GIZ colleagues like Eberhard on the living income concept. However, as the living income, income concept was still in its initial phase, it is not yet much developed in Value Links 2.0, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to discuss it here today. Tim, somebody called your team, your project, as far as I heard, uh, something like uh, the mastermind behind the living income concept. Why do we care about living income and living wages? The story goes back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which basically states that everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself or herself and his or her family an existence worthy of human dignity. And that is exactly the point. This is where the, the dignity concept, the justification for all of this debate, the living income, living wage debate is based on. And um, well, the declaration starts from more of the, the wage side. So the employed point of, point of view. Uh, and this basically was the starting point for researchers, the ILO and the Global Living Wage Coalition. Uh, to, to develop the concept of uh, costs of a decent life. And our contribution is rather to extend this concept to uh, self-employed farmers, to smallholder farmers. How is the minimum requirement for a decent life calculated? Uh, well, there, there are different approaches or methods, and we follow the anchor methodology, which is considered the gold standard in terms of... Um, calculation estimation uh, to, to estimate the cost for a decent living and the strength of this method is first it's based on secondary data or national survey data and it is also based on empirical research so evidence based from field work uh, in in the field directly and the second strength of this method of this tool is it's widely based on normative aspects, so based on internationally accepted norms and standards. For example, just to name one, the World Health Organization, so the health standards are flowing into the calculation. And uh, the whole story is, or the whole, let's call it a living income benchmark or living wage benchmark, has four components. You see that in the little icons on the right hand side. The first one would be uh, nutritious food, so the food aspect. So based on a model diet, which considers nutritional needs of, of uh, the households, based on the WHO recommendations, the, the costs for such a, a basic but sufficient and nutritious diet is calculated. So it takes into consideration these normative standards as well as local market prices for, for different food items, as well as what is available on the local market. The second big block, if you click, there is the housing. So this also follows local and international standards. And uh, this is basically the valuation of what is necessary for a healthy housing. And uh, like, is there an outside kitchen, just to name one example. The third big component is the non-food and non-housing. And uh, that's based on secondary data. I mean, like, keeping the, the costs and, uh, and the preciseness sort of at balance and their post checks for education, for healthcare, for transportation, uh, just to, uh, to validate, so to say, the secondary information which flows into this component. And to top everything up, there is a margin for unexpected events. Usually it's around 5%, depending on the situation, the, the context of the country at, at focus or under research, this might go up to 10%, but uh, in general, it's 5%. What is so special about the living income concept and what is the difference uh, to living wages? The main and core difference is really, uh, let's say, the target group. So the living wage relates to employed piece of people. So employment, they have a job, they have an income uh, or a salary rather. 
and the living income relates rather to independent workers or families, farmers, whoever that is. So it's this self-employment aspect. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you see an example for the living income story. And uh, the living income benchmark, that's these four components. You see it in the green shaded colors, food, decent housing, essential needs, unexpected events. That's sort of similar, more or less, for people living in a certain region. But how to reach the income, that might be different. In the living wage situation, you have only your wage income. In the living income situation, for example, you're a smallholder farmer, you have food crops, you have cash crops, you have livestock, livestock products, which is coming in, you have remittances, you might have other off farm income. So it's much more complex to come to the, the income structure of, of the household. And uh, here you are, it's also visualized, you have the actual income, and then your living income benchmark. And uh, well, most often you end up with an income gap. As far as I know, there's quite some community already behind living wages, living income. So who is that who is behind the concept? Let's say there, there are two big streams based on the living wage and the living income, the differences of it. It started with the Global Living Wage Coalition. That's also where this, uh, you see it in the, the left upper corner. It's, it's the, the living wages around the world book. That's sort of the, the Bible for the how to calculate benchmarks. Uh, but from our side, we are more working, at least at GIZ here in our program and with Eberhard on, on the living income side. And there, well, we sort of co-initiated the living income community of practice which is an international working group um, co-facilitated by ICO Alliance and the Sustainable Food Lab. And by now, the newest numbers is that there are more than 400 subscribers, meaning like, like um, members. So it's a, it's a loose network with regular webinars, annual workshops. Uh, in general, this if you have questions, if you want support in terms of how to calculate, how to collect data, how to estimate annual income compared to the benchmark. This is sort of a place where experience is exchanged and where expertise is, is, is bundled. I'm sure all our webinar participants now know how to calculate the, the living income in detail. But to make it still a bit more clear, I would like to hand over to Eberhard Krein. And uh, Eberhard, maybe you can give us an example about how the actual household income and living income assessment has been done in the T-value chain in Malawi. In fact, uh, that is where we as GIZ um, started to work on living wage and living income uh, together with others, Ethical T Partnership, uh, IDH from the Netherlands, and of course, a number of local um, uh, uh, organizations. Um, and uh, particularly supported by the University of Malawi, where we um, asked them to uh, sample farmers, tea, smallholder farmers, um, so that we could, on the one hand, work on a living income, uh, and on secondly, also on what they currently earn. And in fact, um, uh, from this, we, we, we made some modeling work because farms are, of course, different. And finally, we tried to zero uh, in on a typical model farm with uh, five persons in the household and 0 0.6 hectare farmland, most of it being tea. And then uh, working on uh, also on actual income uh, and, I must say, also taking here the assumption of full employment, which is very often not the case. And for this case, and we converted uh, the, the money um, into uh, US dollar purchasing power parity with which the uh, World Bank is working um, and which has been traditionally for GIZ an important benchmark. And we put it aside with the living income benchmark, which you see here standing at 3.23 US dollar purchasing power. And now uh, what transpired was that the actual household income 
per person per day available is just 1.75 US dollar. So this is much below a living income benchmark and uh, also substantially uh, or still quite significantly below uh, the US dollar poverty line, which we regard as a survival line. So anything that is below the US, uh, the uh, World Bank poverty line, we, re we clearly regard as unsustainable and not fulfilling the human right to have a sort of uh, um, an appropriate uh, remuneration. We would like to move on to the living income reference price, um, Eberhard. Um, how is that calculated? Yeah, uh, this is uh, quite a difficult undertaking. And I would also like to say that uh, fair trade has also worked on, uh, on an approach to come up with a living income reference price. And uh, we are working uh, also, or we are in exchange with fair trade. Um, uh, however, I think we found even um, uh, a faster method through a formula where in the worst case of data available availability, we uh, just need um, the, the income coming from, say, the focus group, uh, the focus crop in order to also work out uh, uh, living income reference price. This formula is just half a year old um, and is, is really in, an, an invention. Um, I should mention that one of the problems is uh, in order to have a good, um, a solid price uh, coming out, you need good and reliable data, which is often not the case. You need a two, two types of data. Number one is household data. You need to know, for example, what is the labor force, the number of people working in, in a typical family, uh, and um, also the number of days a year. Roughly, often there are labor participation rates, and we calculate a full-time labor equivalent with 250 person days per day, per year, sorry. Uh, so we come up with something like uh, 375 work days per year per such a, a family of five. So this is one important part. The other important part, but with which we've already worked traditionally very much in agriculture is a good cross margin analysis with a volume of production, price of produce, uh, the inputs, etc. Inputs such as the input costs, uh, such as uh, planting material, fertilizer, pesticides, and uh, last but not least, the labor input. Uh, how many work days are needed to grow a certain crop and to to harvest it? And this is by far the the most difficult part of it. Um, we developed also another innovative uh, model in order to bring figures into relationship. And this you see on the right hand upper side, we call it the household triangle. On top of it, you find uh, the annual income and uh, that is either produced or calculated, for example, as a living income uh, that is needed for such um, a household um, in total. And this relates to the daily income that is available per household member on the right hand side where you see uh, the bucket, uh, which gives us a good relationship to the World Bank poverty line, which gives us a figure per person per day. Yeah. So the total of the year divided by the number of household members divided by uh, 365 days a year gives us that figure. If we go from the top to the left uh, bottom uh, red box, uh, we take this total income and divide it by the number of full-time equivalents uh, uh, times uh, labor days. We arrive to what needs to be earned in one day in order 
to get to a certain annual income. This is very complex and I could talk about it for another half an hour. We have a written um, handbook on it and um, it is now available as a draft and anyone of you who wants it will get already the draft. It will still take some time until it is published. What do you think? How can we use the living income concept in value chain promotion? Yeah, living income, living wage uh, discussion has very much uh, pushed uh, our development work. It has raised a lot of attention. Um, and it helps us to set up a sort of a new minimum target, a new minimum target that is based, as Tim said, on a human right, 23, section 3. Uh, so it helps us to uh, set this target. Very often in the medium term, this target cannot be reached. Sometimes also it appears unlikely that we achieve it in the long run. But it helps us in monitoring change when we now work uh, through a development uh, effort in initiative, do we make progress or not? And therefore, companies are also quite a lot forced to, um, to do something in order to uh, have a sustainable supply chain. Um, they are, have an, a second important motivation to respect human rights. They, of course, want a good product from primary producers. And if primary producers live in misery, they only have uh, little production and usually quality is very bad. Secondly, uh, governments are also very keen to... Um, uh, that uh, human rights are respected. They are part of the United Nations effort on uh, guiding principles for business and uh, human rights. So far, uh, we have uh, national action plans in a number of countries. They are all uh, so far uh, voluntary, whatever is demanded from companies uh, to put uh, due diligence in their business practices uh, and uh, what uh, has been achieved so far is currently uh, evaluated. Uh, in Germany we have about 3,000 companies being part of this but so far less than 20% have submitted their reports and this of course uh, has raised big debates and uh, 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 brought the demand for getting supply chain regulations, meaning certain laws, not only voluntary, but mandatory mechanisms are called for much more. I think you participated in the Living Income Conference in the Netherlands in November. And what are the main trends in the discussion currently? Where is the field moving to? One is... Uh, on supply chain regulations. And here I want to also uh, put up one point more. It's not only that we work uh, on national level uh, towards such mandatory regulations. By the way, a lot of private companies also demand for such regulations, like Mars was on the stage demanding a supply chain regulations for the respect of human rights and uh, amongst them uh, living wage and living income in order to create a level playing field so that all the companies uh, face uh, the same hill up uh, battle. Uh, secondly, we already discussed the COCOA pack here in the middle uh, photo. You see uh, Dr. Mamadou Bonge of the Conseil Café Cacao, who, um, who, who explained about the, co the COCOA living income differential and who also stated that they, are, that they were greatly inspired by the living income work. And finally, I would like to also mention uh, the, the big and important work of NGOs, um, 
You see Anthony Fountain on the right hand side uh, battling since years in the with the coffee barometer and his uh, voice network, but also Friedel Hütz Adams here from uh, uh, the Südwind um, um, Institute. Uh, and and this has also quite a lot of impact internationally, but also nationally. In the Netherlands, uh, there is a group of Dutch retailers starting uh, with bananas on living wages. We have our own Minister of Economic Cooperation and, Develop, uh, and Development who brought into the discussion the possibility of lowering the coffee tax in Germany for those uh, coffee uh, uh, companies uh, that, um, um, that put due diligence on human rights in their business. 